This is Rob Carbone, and you're listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. This is Rob Carbone coming at you with another episode of BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. Episode 127, 127 episodes in, um, and we are actually, finally, we've moved our way up on the boards here, um, on the draft board. (laughs) You know, we've been discussing lots of pre-draft prospects, but in this upcoming NBA draft um, of late, but, you know, we've been talking about the late, you know, the second round guys or some of the guys who might be selected at the end of the first round, you know, sleeper type of picks, um, who I think would fit the Knicks well, but now we finally made it up to the top of the board and, you know, I, I kind of got tired. I, I know I said I might've, I think in last night's show or, um, you know, if if you listen to this when it came out on uh, May twenty fourth, on a Sunday, I said that um, <laughs> I might have done four or five more of these you know sleeper prospects before we head up to the board. But I, I'm telling you, man, I got tired of just talking about them, and I wanted to get. I really, I was just dying to get to the more exciting you know type of prospects, and um, so we're here. We are here. Episode one twenty seven. We will be picking apart. Um, You know, a prospect that many, many fans have hyped up. Uh, In particular, it's been a prospect that Knicks fans, you know, have hyped up all around Manhattan, all around New York, um, and even here in Jersey. You know, Knicks fans from all over the um, the globe have been talking about Lamelo Ball. You know, and that's that's somebody who is (laughs) very polarizing, I guess you could say. You know, a polarizing prospect, if anything. You know, maybe somebody with a high floor, but also a very low ceiling. Um. So that's what we're going to dive into tonight, guys. So I hope everybody's doing well. You know, before we get to tonight's episode, I just want to thank you all for stopping by. Thank you for coming in and tuning in to BD4. Um, if you're listening to BD4, thank you for that. If you're watching the podcast, thank you for that. You know, if you haven't yet, by the way, subscribe. <laughs> Be sure to subscribe to us. We are on many platforms now. You know, I would say, I don't know, uh, over, over, a dozen uh, platforms now the podcast is on so be sure to subscribe to us on every one of them listen to it download it share it like it make a comment whatever you want please support us that would be great but it's your choice so thank you for coming by if you do want to do all that fun shit head to my website head to nysportstalkrc.wordpress.com forward slash connect so um yeah i think that's it you know <laughs> Um, I am a little tired. I do these episodes at night. You know, I usually record these episodes late night, early morning, you know, so we're talking like past midnight and I get really tired. So it's kind of hard for me, um, to, to really bring energy. So I apologize if, if in some of these past episodes I sound or look very tired, um, but I'm trying to get through it (laughs) and, You know, when I start working out tomorrow, hopefully I'll I'll start getting more energy for this. And, (laughs) you know, because I've been so lazy, guys, during this quarantine, I've not even been working out. I've just been eating, sleeping, watching shit on TV and and repeat, you know. So 
we're gonna we're gonna get through this. Um, but no, I apologize if I've been a little slow or fatigue in these most recent episodes, just because I've had a lot going on. Um, despite this whole you know virus and shit, um, staying busy with the podcast. So at least we're staying busy. Um, I know this the sports world is dying for something. Um, I know there was NASCAR on today. I actually caught that. Um, as I'm recording, it's a Sunday. Um, well, technically it's 12, 11 a.m. on a Monday morning, but yeah, I caught NASCAR. The um, the Coca Cola 600 was on, so I've been watching the last couple of races. Um, <laughs> you know, of trying to find anything, any live event. Um, so hey, I used to watch that a ton as a kid. Not as much anymore, but yeah, let's let's uh, let's dive into this episode. Don't want to go too long, so we're gonna take a quick commercial break and um. Oh, I do want to say, you know, if I've been doing a shit ton of Knicks, you know, over the past couple of months, um, so I apologize to, you know, the, the one or two followers or subscribers, um, who've been wanting me, you know, I don't have many shit. I don't have many followers anyway, but if there are any out there who've been wanting me to do Yankees episodes and do more shows on, on them, I apologize. It's really difficult for me to talk about a team that has nothing going on right now, right? The, obviously, the main subject here is I could be talking about when this season could get, you know, I could be talking about this whole proposal thing. But honestly, man, that's so, uh, I'm not your typical, you know, podcaster who's just going to beat the same old boring horse uh, on that same subject. Will the season, you know, play out will they cancel it you know how's it gonna be i just feel like that's so tired and played out i don't even want to bother talking about that so i i you know i could do one on that but guys i feel like that's such a boring old and played out conversation that's been going on for the last couple of months i feel like if i did an episode on the yankees it would just be boring talking about the same shit plus we've kind of uh we've kind of covered that you know a couple months ago when i had a guest or two on the show but so i really don't feel like doing that you know i I would just feel like that'd be a waste of time and i know a lot of other podcast hosts are also going back and talking about old yankees and kind of ranking their all-time favorites or the all-time yankee list and that to me another you know that that to me is kind of boring i'm not the type of guy who likes to go back and talk about history a lot I just like to stay current, you know, talk about what's going on. But obviously there's not anything going on in baseball right now. Just the same old boring ass conversation that I need to come to. I need the league, the players to come to some kind of agreement or disagreement. I need an answer. You know, at this point, I don't care what happens. I just need an answer so I can go forward with my podcast and know how to. So for fucking now, we're fucking covering the boring old Knicks and, and the NBA draft because at least there's that to talk about whenever that may be. Now, I know the season, actually, there's been more momentum in terms of getting the season back. Uh, we're starting to talk about July, but I kind of feel like we hear that all the time. We've been hearing this. this So until any decisions happen, you know, for both leagues and the MLB, the MLB and the NBA, I'm just going to keep fucking doing my little, you know, prospect scouting reports. So let's, let's head to break. Like I said, um, and, uh, when we get back from break, we will discuss LaMelo ball. All right. Hey fellas, really quick, I just want to remind you, in order to subscribe to BD4, to subscribe to my blog, and to follow me on social media, all you have to do is go to my website. That's it. Just go to nysportstalkrc.wordpress.com forward slash connect. Once again, that is ny sports talk rc dot wordpress dot com forward slash connect once there guys that will display all of my information where to subscribe to the podcast how to subscribe to my blog and where to follow me on social media guys thank you so much and let's get back to the show
is a kid who played internationally for uh, the Hawks. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the first name of the team, but um, yeah, Lamelo Ball, um, a point guard from you know from international ball, played international ball. He's he's a big point guard. He's six seven, 181 pounds, and couldn't find an official wingspan, but the most you know the 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 more reoccurring wingspan I'm seeing as I look it up is six ten and a half. Um, so we'll go with that. Six seven, 181 pound point guard with a six ten and a half wingspan. So a very lanky guy. Um, 18 year old kid doesn't turn 19 until August, which you know we'll be probably seeing the draft sometime around then, if we're being optimistic, I would think. Um, so yeah, he had a good. You know, a good 12 games. It was a short sample size this past year, but through 12 games with 31 minutes per night, he averaged 17 points, 8 rebounds, and 7 assists. Very impressive there. But it was the shooting splits that concerned folks. Um, 38% from the floor, 25% from three, and 72% from the free throw stripe. Um, did this on a volume of 16.7 field goal attempts, 6.7 three-point attempts, and 3.9 free throw attempts per game. Um, <clears throat> defensively 1.6 steals, uh, 0 0.1 blocks, uh, try to find out where I am. Oh, 2.5, uh, 2.5 turnovers per game, 2.6 personal fouls. And again, this was through a dozen games, um, 31 minutes per night. So listen, he, he's a very exciting prospect to many. Um, somebody who I think is going to be, um, he's obviously going to be lottery, but I would say he's a lock to be anywhere from one to three, unless something, you know, upsetting happens and, you know, we see some kind of a drastic change, I would say he's going to be anywhere from one to three. And the most likely scenario here is that he is the number one pick in the draft. So the Knicks would have to get really, really lucky to get a chance to, to take LaMelo ball, you know, luck would have to be on their side in the lottery, which really hasn't been on their side since what Ewing in, in what 85, 86. So <laughs> we'll fucking see. Um, no, listen, it's, it's, um, this is a kid who a lot of people like, again, yeah, he, he has the potential to be an all-star starting point guard, you know, a primary playmaker for a team, but then there's the boomer bust type of feel that many have with him where he could flat out not be very good. And he could just be a bench warmer. Um, we don't know. I've heard a couple of comparisons. It's really hard to find a comparison for him. I've heard three. I will tell you the one I like about him most, or there are two I like about him most, but. Um, you know, I've heard Spencer Dinwiddie, I guess, lanky, a playmaker, you know, who could score off the bounce and kind of has some questionable shot selection leading to mediocre efficiency. You know, those type of, I, I can see the comparison there a little bit, but, you know, and, and we've of course heard Magic Johnson light, you know, place, you know, like a, like a, a playmaker passer, um, somebody who's, you know, got the size at that position, a good rebounder. But the two that I really liked, um, I've seen them float around. I've seen Luka Doncic, maybe not to the extent, but I've seen I've seen Luka, and I've also seen one that I really, really like. I think best is Jason Williams. You guys remember him? Um, they call them white chocolate. I think I'm talking about the right guy there, but um, the guy from West Virginia, very flashy of a passer, it reminds you much of the Mellow Ball, a playmaker who wasn't known for his scoring much, but known for his ability to perfect the playmaking game, you know, in the, at the NBA level. So I, I like those comparisons, right? That flash, that smoothness. And, and obviously the Luka Doncic comparison is because of that too. He, he's pretty smooth and, and mature for his young age. Um, you know, relies on craft over athleticism and, and a pretty good rebounder for his size. So yeah, I've seen a couple of those. <laughs> um, now as for his strengths, I, listen, it, it's playmaking. And then it's everything else, right? I think playmaking is stand it that stands out, that stands alone at the top. When you talk about Lamelo Ball, you're talking about how great of a playmaker he is and how much greater he can actually become. You know, he's somebody who is excellent, excellent, excellent at, at passing the ball and ball handling. So we'll start there. We'll start with the playmaking and then we'll work our way around his strengths and then eventually get to some other uh, weaknesses. Um, but, but yeah, the number one strength guys, it's his ability to, to be an advanced playmaker, uh, very great in pick and roll, very capable in pick and pop, you know, somebody who is an advanced passer, somebody with great vision, you know, an excellent tempo to his game, 
He's just a great passer on the break. His head is always up, always looking around, knows when to hit his guys and where to hit them. But he's also a great dimer in half-court possessions as well. So he can pass at all three levels. You know, he'll hit you in the paint, in the mid-range area, and he'll hit you on the perimeter. So somebody who's very, very effective as the primary ball handler. A high IQ, you know, somebody who's very smart, knows where to, in terms of his passing, he's very smart. His shot selection we'll get to in a little bit, but. In terms of his his playmaking ability, the IQ is there. You know, he can make the flashy pass. He can make the safe pass. Right. He's a very versatile passer. He can pass off the dribble, uh, going downhill. Very ambidextrous. He could pass with either hand. Um, a live action passer, a cross court passer. You name it, guys. You know, a one handed passer. Um, a quick reactor who will make those high level reads. And overall, just has excellent. You know, impeccable timing. And just terrific precision when he's making his passes. You know, he'll hit the roller on time. He'll hit the cutter on time. He'll he'll hit the guy popping out and fading. Um, he'll hit, hit those spot-up guys on the perimeter very effectively as well. So he knows how to pass. He's a great passer. And part of the reason he's a good playmaker is because of his ability to handle the ball. He is also an elite um ball handler you know somebody who can piece together multiple dribble moves seamlessly very effortlessly um knows how to cross up the defender i would say his crossover when he's going downhill he has a terrific crossover also likes that spin move he's pretty crafty pretty shifty with the ball you know knows he dances a lot he likes to dance with the ball in his hands likes to change speeds change directions change angles and you know, kind of keep the defense on their toes that way. Um, but he's just terrific in pick and roll, knows how to split a pick and roll. Reminds me of Kyrie a lot when he plays with the pick and roll. You know, he'll just expose big men in PNR all day if you give him the opportunity. So somebody who just knows how to create, creates for his teammates, just creates excellent separations for, for himself too, you know, on the drive. Um, he's effective at getting to the rim and he's an excellent finisher. Um, he's again, another, another, um, <laughs> talked about his, his ability to pass with either hand. Well, he can pretty much finish, um, with a soft touch at the rim with either hand as well. Pretty ambidextrous there. 55% this past season at the rim. If you exclude his post-ups and putbacks. Um, so overall, just a nice touch at the rim an excellent floater in that mid range, you know, close area to the rim he's very good at throwing that floater up there sometimes maybe he relies on it a little too much but i would say for the most part that's probably his most efficient shot when he's attacking you know going down the lane so very smooth and flashy uh, as somebody who, who who likes to play make you know very very good at, at playmaking and i would think he guys he would fucking bring the knicks so much in that phase of the game, you know, somebody who they need. When have the Knicks had that guy who could create for others as aggressive and as effective as somebody like LaMelo Ball could do? I think his playmaking alone would be such a huge, immense improvement in this offense. So. But then we talk about his, his upside as a shooter. Now this, I'm really not sure about, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get to his weaknesses. But, you know, some people believe there's an upside here. For him to be an above average shooter. Um, he was a respectable 38% on catch and shoot jumpers um, in his 12 games at you know with the Hawks. Um, you know, a lot of people think it's it's shot selection that really harms that efficiency, and that's why it looks as bad as it does. People think he's a better shooter than the percentages show. Um, they also think he's got the length, you know, and this is a true thing. You know, he he's got the length to to shoot over defenders. So Maybe that's something you could look at as an indicator. Um, he gets into his shot fairly quickly too. You know, not somebody with a very fundamentally sound jumper, but he gets into the shot quickly, knows how to, you know, doesn't dip or anything like that on the catch and very quick off the dribble. So maybe another indicator there. Um, just a good creator. And, and remember, he's only a teenager, so there's room to grow, you know. Um, 25% doesn't look good from downtown, but there is room to grow. He's just 18 years old. He just turned 18 last August. So it's not like he's, um, kind of hitting his ceiling, you know? 
So yeah, I I I see the upside as a shooter, although I am still pretty skeptical there. Um, now in terms of his rebounding, listen, he grabbed 18 boards per game. Always has been a great rebounder, though. You know, being that big at a position like point guard, um, got natural instincts, knows where and when the ball is going to bounce off the rim. Um, just boxes out pretty well, takes advantage of his length and uses it. You know, when he's when he's rebounding. Um, and then some other positives here. That I have for LaMelo Ball, he's used to the NY spotlight, or just used to the spotlight, right? He's been in the spotlight his entire life, obviously with, with the fucking father and the Ball family drama. He's used to being in the limelight, and I think that could help him in NYC, right? If the Knicks do opt to draft him, he'll be used to it. Um, and then the last pro here in his game, I've got that. He's got outstanding size for a point guard at 6'7", and some would possibly... Some would say he's possibly taller. So, <laughs> listen, this is somebody who would, I'm almost positive, you know. Um, now, part of the reason may be, be because the Knicks are so lacking in depth at, at the point guard position, but I'm almost positive he would make them vastly better in the backcourt, right off the bat, just because I, I feel like he brings so much that current guards on the Knicks don't. You know, especially when we're potentially talking about losing Dotson, losing Trier. You know, Dennis Smith Jr., I think he could be better than him upon impact. I think he could be better than Neil Aquina upon impact. Um, no, not impact, upon um, entry into the NBA. So I, I just think fucking LaMelo Ball, yes, he might be a project, but I think he would just immediately still bring a positive impact just because of how lacking the Knicks are at point guard. Um, now there are some negatives, okay? Let's not sit here and, and sing his praises forever. There are some really glaring weaknesses. Um, a lot of people want to point, let's start with the shooting concerns, right? A very unorthodox form, kind of looks broke, and it, honestly, it, it may be broke. So he may need to restart, um, you know, and tinker with it a little bit at the very least. You know, it's a very... It's just an ugly form, you know. They got a very low point of you know, um, low point of release. It, it just doesn't look good. The footwork is sloppy at times. The shot, it just doesn't look very pretty. He may need the uh, the Lonzo Ball treatment, right? And that that's not a good sign. Um, so that very much worries me. And of course, the efficiency. We talk about thirty eight percent from the floor, twenty five from three. Just a high volume scorer. Somebody who's going to take a lot of shots because he's a very questionable shooter when it comes to shot selection. So that may worry you some. I know he was only 26%, 11 for 43 on uh, jumpers off the dribble this past season. So, you know, when you look at his catch and shoot ability, um, that's, that's, he was 11 for 26. So 11 for 43 on pull-ups and 11 for 26 on his catch and shoots. Yeah, <laughs> it's a drastic difference. So he's got to do better pulling up off the dribble. And again, that's kind of where a lot of the misses come is when he's trying to take bad shots. and doesn't help his case. Um, sometimes, you know, we mentioned how he's flashy and smooth. He could be a little bit too flashy and smooth at times. You know, sometimes he tries, it, it's, he does it to a fault, you know, where he tries to be a little bit too cool out there and a little too lackadaisical, which can hurt him not only offensively, but hurt him defensively. And that, my friends, is, <laughs> this is my biggest knack, my biggest knock on fucking LaMelo Ball. Um, I love the guy's playmaking. His defense has to improve. <laughs> and the thing that bothers me is it's the effort that comes and goes, right? He's not always engaged at that end of the floor. And that's going to bother everybody in New York. You know, we've, we've, Melo got shit for it, you know? And he, he's pretty, LaMelo is pretty comedic at times. So when you watch him defensively, you know, the first thing I saw, it was a couple years ago when this kid was at Chino Hills, fucking, you know, playing the run out and standing at fucking half court or at the other side of the court when the deep, when the, you know, the possession's going over there just so he can get the, you know, play the break. It, that was embarrassing. And, and I, I'm not saying he did that, you know, when he just played with the Hawks, he didn't, but guys, the effort isn't always there. You know, it's still very laughable at times, you know, he'll be, 
He ball watches when he's far from the action. He will multiple times he'll get caught ball watching or just get caught drifting and, and really just slouches or he's just standing upright, flat footed. So he's got to fix that motor. That motor needs to be there defensively just to show that you can be adequate. I think maybe the tools might be there to where he could be adequate, but he's got to start with effort, and that's going to piss all of New York off. I'm telling you, if he doesn't improve his defense, guys, that is going to piss New York off. <laughs> um, and then, you know, one of the few cons here I've also got are, are that his athleticism doesn't really stand out. Um, he relies on, again, relies on craft and, and his acrobatic type of layups and, you know, kind of his passing wits as opposed to his athleticism. He's not an extraordinary athlete, not somebody who's very physical. In fact, he's kind of, you know, since he's very skinny, frail with a weak frame, he's kind of soft and he's had trouble, you know, finishing through contact and how is he going to, you know, that's, that's also concerning, you know, when he's going from you know, playing internationally, going to the NBA where everything is much bigger, faster, stronger. How is he going to do? How is he going to fare at the rim? Is he going to be as successful at the rim? You know, he he's not, it's going to be much more physical. It's not going to be what he's used to, you know? Now I understand he's been a teenager playing in these men's leagues, but I still feel like the NBA is a different animal, no matter what your past experience was elsewhere. That's something I'm going to keep an eye on. How well could he be as a finisher with that weak frame in the NBA? Um, and then the last couple of things are, you know, do we really, really want this whole um, ball family drama? You know, do we want the Kardashians of the NBA, so to speak? You know, do we want LeVar Ball at MSG, you know, courtside? Um, causing media shit storms, right? I can already envision it, guys. I can already envision LeVar right next to Spike Lee and just, I can already envision the ESPN first take segments, right? The criticizing the Knicks. He's going to get on them. I can already see that. Uh, making Just making them seem more of a joke than they already are. I can so well see LeVar Ball and, and this whole thing turning into a disaster, you know, in terms of the the drama, the unnecessary drama that ball could bring. And it's not on him. The poor, the kid is, is he's not the one causing it. It's the fucking father. Do we want that guy at Madison Square Garden? I know I don't. I, it, that, that's concerning. So there are, there are a lot of concerns when it comes to this guy. That's why he's so polarizing. There's so many up, you know, so many things that leads you to believe there's a tremendous upside here, but then there are some things that really, really concern you. So is he, you know, he could be a pro a, a project too. You know, he might, I mentioned he, the impact, you know, will be right away because the Knicks are, are tremendously lacking in that area, but how far away is he from being, you know, that all-star that we possibly think he has potential to be, you know, is it worth the wait? How long is that going to take? Um, but those are just some weaknesses and some pros. And, and, you know, I, all in all, guys, I would still, this is my guy. You know, I think he is, he is the orchestrator that the New York Knicks need. You know, he will bring them both the playmaker they've been missing at the point guard position, you know, maybe since Marbury, really. And he will bring them the, the potential of being a good shooter. Um, but that's, you know, that's a concern because he and RJ Barrett, you know, they could mesh well in that backcourt, but the concern here would be, you know, does it bring enough shooting if neither are going to, you know, really pan out as shooters, right? I would say at least one of RJ or LaMelo would have to improve their shooting to at least adequacy in order to make this work. You know, somebody's got to improve there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, I mean, all in all, guys, I think he would thrive tremendously here. Um, he would play. I can imagine him playing terrifically, being paired with um, Mitchell Robinson. You know, I can see them operating a very smooth and effective, productive pick and roll game. You know, he would throw him lobs and maybe just help expand Mitch's game. You know, maybe with balls pick and pop potential, he could kick him, kick it to Mitch. You know, for the twelve footer here and there, help expand his game a little bit. He could also maybe help Julius Randle while he's here uh, become more of an efficient player and you know less ball dominant. 
Um, and just overall could make this Nick offense much less stagnant and much more fluid, you know. So, all in all, despite the big time flaws, I would take my chances with the mellow ball. You know, I, if he landed in the Knicks spot and if the Knicks were fortunate enough to, to be smart and take him, um, I would not hate it. He's, you know, I've got two guys that I really fucking want. The mellow ball is one of them and the guy who we're going to cover. Um, it might be next. It might be next couple of episodes, but that's the other guy I want. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say the name yet. We'll, we'll get to it. But if you do follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and all that fun shit, you'll know who I'm talking about. But LaMelo Ball is one of the two guys who I really, really want. Um, yeah, great playmaker, great guy in pick and roll, somebody who could really benefit the Knicks. Does he pan out? So high floor, I'm sorry, high ceiling, low floor, sure. But I, I guess that's the risk you're going to have to be willing to pay in a draft class that's pretty shallow outside of him. So that's it, guys. That's all we've got on BD4 tonight. Uh, I hope it was a good episode. I felt like, again, I fucking, uh, I fucking rushed it and talked too fast. But again, that's because I'm tired and I'm trying to get to bed. Um, but... You know, hey, it's nobody listens to this shit anyway, so it's not like it matters. So <laughs> thank you guys for coming by for those of you who did. And yeah, this is your host, Rob Carbone, with episode 127 of BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. And I'm signing out. All right, ciao.